Hello, I am Tato Cat, and welcome to my channel. Today we are playing the letter. Previously, we, uh, after breaking into the BRC Realty place, we discovered that a lot of the people were connected to the Armagar Mansion and disappeared. And, um, Isabella finally told Ashton that her dad died. And death. Yeah, that's pretty much where we left off. Alright, let's continue. Yet, somehow, somehow, I still find myself grasping for things to tell her. Any words of comfort. I love all the pain. And it's always an awkward moment because there's really nothing you can do to make it better. Because, even without looking at her, her grief feels palpable enough her pain in an immutable weight hanging over us so I gently offer just stay busy tell me about him fantastic advice so Ashton my dad is dead yeah, just push that deep down. Stay busy. Don't think about it. Everything will be okay that way. Uh, tell me about him. When? That's not what I meant. I meant, tell me about your father's personality. Well, she likes me better for it. Okay. <laughs> huh? When what? Your... Your dad. I mean, when did you find out? Yeah, that's also a good point. I don't remember it in her throat. She doesn't answer. Not immediately, anyway. For a long moment, the hush simply stretches out before us. Spinning across the seconds we let pass, while we both simply stand there, waiting. Also, isn't this a type of thing that we should not be doing right now? I mean, <laughs> we're kind of in the middle of stealing some records, you know. Yeah, do we really have the time to just sit here and chat like this? Eventually, she exhales. Lightly, muted enough that I might have missed it, had not been paying attention to her every movement. Yesterday. Oh, poor Isabella. Around three in the afternoon there, Mama called. She, she told me he passed away in his sleep, and I guess, I guess I can take comfort in that, huh? But Papa wasn't in any pain when... She trails off, uses another ragged breath, hidden underneath her chuckles. Each one's mirthless, heavy with nothing but sorrow. Then she falters into silence, and for all my attempts at lightening her burden, I'm suddenly at a loss. Reassurance could only do so much. And her only reason for staying here has suddenly been taken away from her. I hope yanked from under her feet right after it was generously given. And without that? Without the one person who pushes her to endure these... All the shit we're going through, she's going through. It's nothing but a struggle. What does one say to a person, praying at the edges, slowly wearing thin and breaking? Are words even enough? Nope. What right do I have anyway? I can't give her anything apart from lies that changed me as a person, and affections she may or may not even want for herself. 
because no matter how easy she was warmed herself into she has warmed herself into our lives how immutable her presence has become her own heart will always yearn for something else for home tell me about him huh about what about your dad bro your dad tell me about him anything just just talk. Say anything you want. Doesn't matter what it is. I'll listen. Silence again. As if she's testing the weight of my question. For what purpose it is. For a reason even I can't say right now. After a while though, she starts. Reluctantly, her voice hitching, faltering, and stumbling on each syllable as she chooses her words. A rough start, but soon it steadies. And along with it, keep company the stories from childhood and memories she's fond of. Achievement locked. A shoulder to cry on. Aww. Are the tears. Despite this, in spite of grief choking her words off, the hurt closing her throat, and the sobs racking her life form, she continues, like the mere act of speaking is a relief in itself. A release. She tells me of her father, the very person who named her, how she looked up to him, how she has, uh, was a bit of a tomboy growing up in her attempts to imitate him, and how the man encouraged her to pursue what she really wanted, perhaps even the only thing she ever did for herself, having grown up not wanting anything more than food to put on their tables. He told me I don't have to listen to them, that I can do what I want. Every day, he'd wake up at four, Ash, because he'd earn more that way. And every time, every single time, he'd give them to me. Whatever extra he earned, he'd hand them all, so that I'd have something to use for my paintings. And you know what? Back home, just a good tube of paint costs almost as much as what we spend for food the whole day. But he'd always set something aside. He told me he wanted to see my paintings in a museum one day. She pours all of it out. Every little thing she loved and admired about him. Like this, it's easy to see why she has gone to such great lengths for him. Why she abandoned her dreams. Why she went against his wishes. Just to grant him another chance at life. Others will say it's her warmth that draws people to her, or her cheer. Neither are wrong, but neither is the whole truth to her either. Because those who have never bothered to look beyond the surface will never see it. See her. See someone earnest. Someone who has always meant well, despite her underlying stubbornness. And this is how... She loves warm, steadfast, unflinching. Never meet many people like her, not in my line of work. Not with the kind of people I've had to deal with. Always with something to hide. Always with something to lie about. Eventually, when you run across too many of them, you change, become like them, in many ways, for a lot of reasons, she's, she's the kind of person I want to be and be around with, who made me feel 
I'm still worth something. He didn't want me to leave. Said, begged, that I should finish my studies first. In the end, I couldn't even... I couldn't even grant him that one request. I'm a terrible daughter, aren't I? You're not. Huh? Is Ashton crying too? You're not. I can't speak for your dad. I haven't even met the man. But I know you're not. I'm not entirely sure where I'm going with this. The remark just came out. Now I'm stringing all these together as I go. But one thing is certain. None of what I'm about to say is a lie. The Isabella I know is a total klutz, but I've never seen anyone work as hard as she does. She's the type who wears her heart on her sleeve, though it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's always in the right place. She's intimidated by a lot of stuff, but she knows how to appreciate the smallest things in life. Frankly, you've caused us no small amount of trouble since you barge into our lives. But when I'm with you, when I'm with you, all of my worries seem trivial. Heat has already crept up my face. I'm gonna turn. This whole thing is about to take registers. Before I blurt the rest of it out, declare feelings I'm not even ready to reveal to anyone, much less to her, my hand comes up to smother the rest of it. Though, embarrassment quickly takes the reins before I can completely clamp my mouth shut. And I'm pretty sure Zack and Becca think the same way. You have a nasty way of growing on people like that, and... And... You know what? We got everything we needed in here. I'll just wipe the security recordings and we're good to go. While I'm at it, you... You better wipe the snot off your face. And you don't look very nice when you're balding like that. Oh, Ashton. You're so awkward. Okay. Yeah. Mm hmm There we are. While gathering what they found, Ashton accidentally brought up Isabella's father, who had apparently passed away the day before. Suddenly, her reasons for trying to fix this mess became clear to him. In his attempt to comfort her, he ended up almost admitting something he's not ready to put to words. He also has like a lot of journal entries. Maybe he just feels like it's a lot because it's not spread out like everyone else's. I lost my cursor. There it is. Hastily, I gather everything, the personal files, client documents, sales agreements, and contracts. Anything my hands could reach. In record time, all of it has been stacked in a neat pile, ready for storage. I'm heading for the records room, not a few seconds later. Wherever that is. It should be easy to find unless this place is a maze of some sort, which I highly doubt. Still, beats staying here and seeing the look on her face. Crap. Really, her anger is still bearable. I can take that, including the glower she sends my way. So, uh... Yeah, I'll I'll go get the security videos and put these back where you pulled them from. Man, these these are heavy, you know. <laughs> Ash, it's just paper. You don't even know where I. Oh no, I can I can handle this, easy as pie. And uh, yeah, security cams, tapes, videos, cams. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm off. 
her rejection at this point? Maybe. Not yet. Dot dot dot. Getting the files back to BRC's archive room is a cinch. Put the documents back in their proper places. I lock the door behind me, tugging it twice just to make sure. Now in the next order of business, removing evidence of our little excursion in here. Or at the very least, the parts showing what we've been doing during the past hour. Can't have our faces plastered on security footage showing us breaking the law, as it were. I'm gonna have to wipe the data for Isabella's access card entries too. Surprisingly, finding the security room proves a breeze. What will be tricky is getting inside. The fact that no one has walked out during the whole time we've been here means the room is either empty or the security is sound asleep. I'm thinking more on the former. If they're cutting corners and firing agents, I have no doubt that they fired the guys stationed here. If they have anyone watching the monitors in the first place. It's rather common thing for establishments just to leave security recording indefinitely and only check the footage if something actually happens. Just to check, I press my ears against the door, listening for a sign of anyone occupying the room. After a long minute, and nothing, I give the knob a few rattles. Standard lock and key. Should be easy enough to pick. It of course, he's going to uh, pick the lock, because why not? We have a we have lock pick sets, but those are only to be used if necessary and with a search warrant. Even then, with a skill set rarely needed. Subtlety isn't on a cop's priority if they have authority to search the premise. Bolt cutters and brute force are the favored methods. If those fail, they call a locksmith. Me? I prefer the good old hairpin trick when those options aren't available. Besides, they're easy to hide and store for emergencies. Running my hand through my hair, I pull out a pair of bobby pins. Two of these and I can just about open any standard lock. One makes a lever, the other makes a hand. I won't call it a complex skill, but it certainly takes time and a lot of practice to successfully pick a lock. Good thing I practiced with them for a bit in my college years. I learned more when they're accessible and standard issue for the law enforcement officer. I Google here, I click there, and I managed to seize all the pins in the locking mechanism soon enough. With a slight turn of the knob, the security room's ripe for the picking. Let's see. Is she going to appear on the screen? Oh, there's Isabella. Oh, there's a thing here. Looks a bit shadowy now. There's a thing down here. The room's odor hits me first. A sharp, nauseating stench, as if someone has accidentally spilled a gallon of bleach in the room. When was the last time they opened this place? Ugh, this place smells awful. Jesus, it's worse than the forensics lab on a bad day. This is probably because of a badly botched effort to clean the place up. Even in the dark, I can spy dark stains on the walls. I really don't have the time to try and play is this ketchup or soda right now, but I have the strange gut feeling who the mess might belong to. As expected, no security personnel mans the office 
the CCTV controls, and the standalone DVR setup is open for anyone. Normally, I have to keep up things to say about this sloppy security setup, but right now, my negligence makes the whole task of erasing evidence easier. No fuss, no muss. Next one should be the access card data. Hopefully getting to their computer won't be too much of a hassle. Everything up to now has been smooth sailing. There have been hiccups, I'll give it that, though it does nothing to dampen the good mood I'm in. Once I shift my attention to the machine setting next to the DVR setup, all of it swiftly evaporates. I'm no computer buff, but I can definitely recognize one more than a decade old, simple be looking at it makes me feel younger. <sighs> the heavy sigh, I power it up and mentally prepare myself for a slow slug slow, apparently remains as understatement here. It takes a whole three minutes for the thing to start up. The OS hasn't even started loading and in my boredom I start inspecting the live feeds from the cams. Only two works. One, for the view outside. Everything seems to be in order there. And the other, for the main workspace where It's a fleeting glimpse of a cursory glance, but the sight of it stops me. But that right there, that thing, is that what you're talking about? Dun dun dun! It's like no dun 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 not, so I have to add my own, okay? But this is kind of messing with my eyes a little bit. The image is a bit blurry, but standing there, right in the middle of the room, one of the cubicles, I can make out the form of a... What the hell is... I don't get too far into that line of thought. No few seconds after my words have slipped out without any sort of warning, I'm still trying to make sense of what it is. Uh oh. The figure moves. I am really liking this game, by the way. <laughs> It takes a lot of work to do all these things. They do a pretty good job at it. A moment of paralysis hits me when she stops right in front of the camera. Like a damn rookie, I go still in the face of danger. I definitely haven't been trained to handle the supernatural. And this one, this is one, isn't it? And. Oh, fuck. Her eyes bore into me. The malice in them. Piercing. Even beyond the screen, it's enough to make me go numb. Oh, what just broke? Okay, that answers my question. Only the mug crashing to the floor when my hand accidentally takes a swipe at it. Snaps me out of the trance. Reminding me that I'm not the only one here. Isabella. Seems she hasn't noticed anything. Am I the only one seeing this? In any case, whatever is not happening, I have to get her out. Gathering my wits, I quickly reach for my phone. It takes but all two seconds. Won't the ghost notice this and just turn towards Isabella instead? before she answers, but there's no time for relief. Ashton? Did you really 
have to call. We're practically on the same floor. Get out of there. What? Why are you... Out. Get out. I'll meet you in the elevator. Just... You're creeping me out, Ash. Uh... <laughs> okay, you are aware of the situation you're in, right? So, if your friend calls you, he's like, hey, get out. You don't go like, Ugh, you're making it creepy. Why are you doing this? No. you just like, okay, cool, thanks, and then you run. Especially since she's been through so much already. Just why? Just get yourself out of that place, now! Without, se without second thought, I back away from the controls, from the room, ready to be done with this place. But before my foot even moves, she disappears. Son of a- Well, hello! Instinct instantly takes over, and my hand quickly reaches for the gun at my side, only to meet empty air. A mistake that cost me a few precious seconds. All the paperwork I brought with me threatens to scatter everywhere at the same time. Gathering everything and myself once more, with no weapon to protect myself, I sense that self-preservation kicks in next. And I lunge towards the door. I sprint across the office without daring to look back. Isabelle is already waiting in front of the elevator by the time I make it out of their office. Lori increases her eyebrows upon glancing at me. I don't have time to answer the question in her eyes. As soon as I reach her, I grab her arm, practically throwing the two of us into the open elevator, and slam the button for the ground floor. A sigh of relief escapes from me when the elevator starts to descend. It's descent. The clicking noise fades off into the distance. Besides me, Isabella shifts, moving the stack of papers under her arm while she takes in my appearance. Concerns in her eyes, though well, all I offer her is a small gesture of my hand while I attempt to compose myself. Breathe. <sighs> In. Out. Why are we in such a hurry? Because there's a ghost, Isabella. You know this, right? We, we need to get out of this place. Did you get everything? Yeah, it's all here. But really, you, you don't look too good. What's wrong, Ash? I'll be fine. Just, I was in the security room. There's, from the monitors, there was a fucking... Oh, great, great. So this is probably also not a great place to be when there's a ghost chasing you. It's like, you know, Scary Movie 101. The rest of what I'm about to say dies on my tongue. And the elevator stops and the door's open too. Dot, dot, dot. There's a moment's pause while we both take in our surroundings. Infusions, understandable there. Oh, come on! They should just replace this whole thing! No. No, I'm quite sure I pressed for the ground floor. Right? But it's just as Isabel said. The elevator always did have problems when I visited in the past. Often, she becomes so angry whenever we try to get to her floor, and she'll have to repeatedly smash the button for the elevator to even move. That was always good for a laugh. I wasn't too worried then, now. Mm-hmm. From the distance. Beyond the light's reach, the noise echoes in my ears, along with the rapid pounding in my chest. It 
Isabella stiffens and her eyes grow wide at the sound. Tenderly, she reaches up to grab the hem of my sleeve and grips it hard, tight enough for her fingers to dig through. Well, we'll end this episode here on a cliffhanger. It's been a while, hey? And, uh, we'll see how Ghost Lady attacks us in the next episode. I'm Tablecat. If you have one, I like, comment, and subscribe. Have a wonderful morning, evening, afternoon.